All right. Enough talking from us. Now you guys. Now you can listen to some guys talking from Bismarck. You suppose they got an accent? In Bismarck. Yes. We'll find out here in a minute. Our speakers tonight. They were here about five years ago. They had seeked us out because their TV show had finally made it out to our part of North Dakota. So they wanted to come talk to you guys because they know that you guys are the ultimate outdoor adventurers in eastern North Dakota. And we seek them out this time because we know they are the ultimate outdoor adventurers in all of North Dakota. So they decided to come on, come back out again. They've had a TV show going now, they tell me, for 14 years that they've had this TV show going throughout all of North Dakota. A lot of it's hunting. There's a lot of fishing. And what they're looking for, just like most of the people in this room, they're looking for the ultimate outdoor adventure. Every time we go fishing, we're looking for that. And that's what they do. They do it all day, every day, except when they're making money at the real job. Because everybody knows this job doesn't pay any money. So, uh, they're here to talk about, they're from Bismarck, uh, a couple school teachers, and a, you work at a construction and sales company. So they, they have very busy lives. They're, they have full-time jobs, they have families, and then they do all this stuff on the side. And they drove all the way here from Bismarck just to come talk to you guys. They want to talk about Lake Sakakawea. How many of you guys have ever fished on Lake Sakakawea or the Missouri River system? There's quite a few of us. And as we all know, it changes quite rapidly. Uh, we're going to talk about some of those changes tonight. Uh, there are a couple of, there's actually three of them. We have Kurt Trotto, Jason Ray, and John Arman, who did not make the trip. But we have two of the three. And they're, between the three of them, they're some of the most knowledgeable anglers in North Dakota on the Missouri River system. So we're really privileged to have them here. So while he's getting that... You run out of things to talk about. You distracted me. I was looking at that cool, cool picture you got on there. Anyway, so let's give Kurt and Jason a very warm FM online welcome. stuff to say, so. <laughs> there we go. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Yeah, I always have a lot of stuff to say. While well, Kyle is trying to work on this a little bit, uh, a special thanks for letting us come out here again. And uh, I was telling Kurt last night as we were going through this seminar a little bit that it's been five years, probably to the, almost the day since we've been out visiting with the club. And, and uh, I personally am quite jealous of this club, possibly because uh, we're going to run. Okay. Uh, you know, I've followed this club for a long time, and social media has allowed me to, to follow a lot of the guys that I know. I look forward to the outings and the pictures you guys put out there. I really look forward to the Winnipeg trip you guys take and, and get together with the club up north, and uh, wow, what a special opportunity. Um, you know, we have clubs back home too, and I think Kurt and I were just talking about uh, we do have our regular jobs, and then Ultimate Outdoor Adventures TV is another job, and then uh, we have our families, and so it's, it's really hard to join, uh, whether it's an archery club or, a, or a, our fishing club, and, uh, and be part of that. And it's something, even driving out here, I, and every time I come out here or I'm talking to these guys, you know, you're kind of missing out on something. Granted, I've had an opportunity with, with two of my best friends, uh, uh, and the things I've been able to do too, it's, it's great. But uh, it, you guys just have a different kind of opportunity, and I'm definitely jealous of this, this club in a way, and, and the, the proficiency of this club, and the willingness to help with, with kids and other people, and just the, the amount of knowledge that everyone has in this room right here. I gotta agree with, with Jason on a lot of that, what he said. I mean. It's been five years since we've been here last. We've been following a lot of the stuff you guys post, like he said. It, it's good to see all that. It's good to see everybody showing up. It just, like, like he said, it kind of just makes you envious of what you guys have. I don't know if you guys know how, how strong this club is from the outside looking in. 
Um, I think you guys got a special thing going. I think all of you participate in a lot of these events to help each other out, to help kids out, and also to have some fun, you know, obviously for yourself. The trips you guys share with each other, the trips we share with each other are some of the best times in my life. They really are. I mean, we, we spend from August 15th up until the end of our hunting season, which is, let's just call it the end of December, we spend nearly every weekend together. We're with each other more than we're with our wives. Every weekend we're gone. Um, five days a week we're at work. Uh, evenings we're doing family things. We're doing some editing out at our shop. So it, it's a busy four months in the fall. Now that things have settled down, now it comes to times like this, um, these things are enjoyable to us. The traveling to and fro, all these events, whether it's a, a hunting trip, a fishing trip, or a seminar or whatever, it, it's part of the trip, it's part of the adventure for us. And um, yes, we are looking for the ultimate outdoor adventure, but I think every weekend is that for, for us. We're, we're lucky to be doing what we're doing. Trust me, it hasn't come with a lot, it hasn't come without a lot of sacrifice. And most of that sacrificing is is to our family, and in my case, my, my spouse. My wife, she's home a lot, alone all fall. Um, now it's time to make up for all that lost time, but uh, um, a little bit of background on, on us and what we're doing, and um, now we're trying to shift gears. Hunting season is over for us. Trying to shift gears into some of the seminars, the fishing stuff, and for Jason and I, that's a kind of a welcome thing, because Jason and I have an equal love for both the outdoors and in, in the hunting and fishing aspect. Our other partner, John, is more of a, a, a hunting person, and which is nice for us when it comes to filming our fishing events. He's out there doing it, and, and he's really not missing a whole lot of it. So it works good for us three. We've been doing it together. We're in our 13th season. We'll be going into our 14th season this fall. So it's been a long time. We've spent a lot of good times together. We've had some ups and downs like everything else, but uh, um, when they asked us to come back out here and do this, we were more than happy to do it again. But we are going to touch on a little bit. We know you guys, you guys are as, as good as fishermen as anybody out there. Some of you guys are better at this, some better at that. So we're not going to talk about what rods to use, what jigs to use, what line to use, that kind of thing. Um, even though some of the simplest things out there, we still can learn from each other. I don't, I don't care how good we think we are, there's always somebody around the corner that can teach us something. We've got to keep an open mind whether it comes to a, a good live baiter, a good troller, a good jigger, whatever it happens to be. And uh, we're no different than that. There's all kinds of things out there you guys could teach us. But what we're going to touch on tonight is, you know, trying to, out west, <laughs> Our bodies of water, our, our river system opens up a little earlier than the lakes do out here in the eastern part of the state or Minnesota or what have you. So I know a lot of you guys come out there to fish the river before things get started here. If you're like us, you're chomping at the bit come April to get on the water. I mean, ice fishermen, a lot of us are, are avid ice fishermen, but for me, getting on the open water, there, there's nothing better than that. Even the ride down the river, in, a, in an open water situation, I don't care if it's 30 degrees or, or 60 degrees, it's pretty enjoyable. Jason and I get a kick out of every time you're running down the river just the first time, crack that throttle open and just, you know, just let her go. So it's a good thing. We're going to touch a little bit on the Missouri River system, uh, Lake Oahe and Lake Sakakawea. What we're anticipating the outlook to be for this year, try and give you guys some ideas, some tips where to go, what might be productive, some basic techniques. We're not going to get into a lot of the, the ifs and buts with the rods and reels and you know that type of thing, but uh, an a, a, a outlook on the situations out west. There are some great opportunities this year, and there's some that are going to be a little tougher than normal. So we'll get started with some things. Um, I'll let Jason kind of get her going here. Yeah, and just a little bit of background about me, too, is I really love that. I really love to know the fishery that I'm fishing, and uh, I use every tool possible when it comes to the technology that we have available to us, and I just love it, as well as all the data that I can get from the Game and Fish Department. I love the test results, the netting results, and all that kind of stuff, and, and that's where a lot of this is going to come from here. And, uh, you know, our personal experience is going to be major here, and 
you know, as Kurt has mentioned, I mean, the, the, the Missouri River Reach and Lake Sakakawea, it, it's our home. It's kind of like our baby. Love it. But as far as I'm concerned, you don't manage these bodies of water. They, Mother Nature dictates so much here. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the history of this, the, both fisheries actually, and uh, locating and targeting some fish. And we're going to, you know, concentrate on the spring, summer, and some of the higher elevation situations, which we're actually looking at right now, which is pretty cool. But I really want to encourage you to ask some questions here, because last night when we got together to kind of go through this the final time, we ended up deleting a lot of stuff. We looked at this slide and thought, yeah, I don't know. They, they probably know this. And, and we know you've had some <coughs> incredible people speak, and so you've, you've been told certain things and, and explained about certain things many, many times. So if you have a question, stop us and ask. But, uh, you know, do. you're going to see a lot about Google Earth here in Navionics and uh, also about uh, contour maps. I love them all. When I'm spending time in any body of water, I'm using Google Earth. I'm using my Navionics, whether it's on my computer or my phone, and I have my, uh, my, uh, hard, my hard copies of the uh, contour maps of whatever body of water I'm fishing. I have them all out there. I love them. I'm not saying it makes me this expert fisherman but I love to find something new about the body of water I'm fishing. I just love that. And uh, Google Earth is really incredible when it comes to all this stuff. It's kind of like putting a game plan together. You sit back at camp in, in between days on the water or a weekend or whatever with your buddy. That's something we both enjoy, whether we're strategizing a, a new lake or a new hunting area. The maps are, are a key thing to this. Sitting around, putting it all together, going out, trial and error, we all know there's no better experience on the water or fishing than on the water. I mean, I can preach, I can tell you, I can talk, you can listen, but there's no better teacher than going out on the water yourself and giving it a try and, and trying to make a game plan, putting that stuff together, going out and making it happen. To us, that's one of those ultimate outdoor adventure days because it, when, when the plan comes together, everything's worth every minute of, of effort you put into it. If we start going with this data and you want to hear some different things, when you hear some presentations, let us know. But we're going to go back to pretty much 2005. Those of you that fish Lake Sakakawea or have been there the past 10 years, I think you're going to appreciate some of this. But in 2005, we were entering into uh, a number of years of drought. And Lake Sakakawea had really dropped. And uh, with this, of course, we lose a lot of uh, uh, forage. We lose, we lose spawning habitat. And of course, that's going to make a big difference in natural reproduction as well as all stocking efforts. Um, now, we kind of move forward. By about 2009, we were starting to see an increase in, this, in the, the elevation of water. And we were building this lake and this reservoir back up. Then, of course, 2011 hit, and we had a, a severe situation. We flooded. And this lake was high. And we went into the spring extremely high. We went into the fall of 2010 extremely high. You know, with the rain, the snow, and everything else, it really impacted things in a real negative way. Uh, the entrainment that happened, most notably, the smelt. And for the walleye fishermen, that was major. That was a major thing because we had an extremely high population of 2005 fish. So these were fish were, were six years old, and they needed food to survive. Um, now, the long-term effect with the flooding with these walleyes, it, uh, it didn't affect the long-term effect like it could have. Uh, but we definitely noticed a, a, a tough situation. One thing you guys got to remember, and some of you, this is going to be basic information to you. Some of you maybe don't realize this, but you got to think out west, uh, a reservoir and a river are nothing like lakes you guys have out in Minnesota or anywhere else in the country. Uh, the river and the reservoir fluctuate. The only similarity you have there would be on a reservoir where you have structure that a lot of time it stays real similar from year to year. What you don't have similar is water levels. And over the last decade, two decades, our water levels have gone like this. So your favorite spot along the rocks this year when the water was at 1840 is nothing like it was two years when it was 1820. You're talking 20, 20 feet fluctuation in water levels. That reservoir is 100 miles long, you know, and three, four, five miles wide. That's a lot of water. So there's no year that's the same out there, unless these water levels stay stable, which they have not done in the last two decades. I mean, they've been so up and down. So trying to adapt to these rivers and reservoirs are very, very tricky. You cannot plan from one year to another. 
you know, one thing we have to appreciate, especially when it comes to Lake Sakakawea, is the fact that we lose vegetation when we have high water. Unfortunately, in order to get that vegetation back, we need to go through a drought situation. So starting in 2005 through 2009, we had extreme growth. We had cottonwoods, and we had trees that were 15, 20 feet high by 2010. Uh, the shoreline was littered with vegetation. It was great. But what you want to happen then, of course, is you want the reservoir to slowly increase. You know, we want to use a little of that natural vegetation at a time. It needs, we need that for the young of the year, we need that for spawning, we need that for the forage, we need that for the, the bugs and the insects, we need that for the entire fishery. But when 2011 hit, that, uh, we, we, we flooded everything and we broke down that vegetation, <coughs> which was really tough. Now, it was great. It was, it's like adding a whole bunch of food and every possible piece of vegetation to an aquarium right off the bat and then just saying that's it. No more now for three, four years. So that was one of the, the negative effects of the flood, which we are still going to see today. Uh, we had an extreme significant shoreline and bluff erosion. With that, we lose gravel and spawning substrate. And so even today, we're still seeing some of, some of the struggles that, from the natural reproduction. Okay, we do stock Lake Sakakawea. It's a management tool, but we want as much natural reproduction as possible. But with that high water, we lost a lot of the bluffs, and then it, it, it silts in and it starts covering up the natural spawning substrate. Each, each year, like I said, is different up there. But <clears throat> what that, that loss of shoreline and bluff erosion I mean, the water's down here, the water's up here. Well, now you get those 30, 40, 50 mile an hour winds that blow, and they blow, and they blow, and they blow. Some of your favorite spots from 10 years ago, when the water was up at this elevation, well, they're no longer there. There's totally, total erosion of peninsulas that have stuck out in that reservoir for a quarter mile that were 50, 60, 80 feet tall and wide. They're all gone. They've literally just collapsed into the lake. So there's spots that you used to fish that aren't even there anymore. You know, and obviously they're changing. Depth alone is not just changing, but the, the shorelines are changing. The point to a lot of this is we're constantly hearing, and no matter what body of water, lake, river, reservoir, we want management tools put in place. We want slot limits. We want one over 24 inches. But we, when you have a reservoir like Lake Sakakawea and the Missouri River, let's just say we had had all this in place. Everything was going perfect. We had an abundance of 22 to 26 inch walleyes in Lake Sakakawea. We get the flood in 2011, we wipe <coughs> everything out. We lose the stock, the food's gone, the vegetation is going to be wiped out in one year because it's getting broke down with, with wave action, this high water. We lose everything. We lose the fish anyway. So it's a real tough situation. We do have some year classes that are missing. Um, we have some year classes that are real strong. So that's why you can go to Lake Sakakawea kind of one year, and you're catching this size fish, and the next year it's this size fish, and then it seems like we go, you're either catching 14 to 16s or you're catching 20 to 21s. And it's because of this fluctuation, and it's mother nature. It really has nothing to do. I mean, we practice catch and release as much as we possibly can, but when you build this beautiful habitat up for these fish and you wipe it out in one or two years, it's really tough. So now you're starting from scratch. Since 2011 now, We've, we've hung in there at a really nice elevation as far as water is concerned. But it isn't really allowing us to build that vegetation that's so necessary for these fish. The spawning habitat is coming back. Natural wave action is washing that stuff away. So we have this substrate coming back. The spawn last year was actually fairly, fairly good. Um, this, is, this is something that we look at a lot. Water levels on that reservoir and the Missouri River system itself it means a lot to a fisherman. It can be the difference between knowing you're going to go out and have an extremely successful week or spring, summer, fall. <coughs> you know things are going to be tough. But if you look back at some of this, we go all the way back to May of 2008. We started the year at 1810. That's the elevation. Okay, 2009 we jumped up 23 feet. Okay, and we went up, you know, another 10 feet. Then we're up another 10 feet almost. Now we drop. In 2012, believe it or not, um, we had dropped to the point where with the warm summer temperatures we had and the loss of smelt, that 2013 was going to be the last year that that lake was going to be able to handle low waters. In 2013, in May, we had actually climbed. Um, 
in, I want to say, February of 2013, we were looking at about an 1823. Our elevation was so low, and that we knew at this time that 2013 was going to be the end if we had a lot of heat during the summertime. Boat ramps were not going to be usable. You know, for whatever reason, Mother Nature kicked in. Let, let me interrupt Jason real quick. Those of you that aren't totally familiar with these elevations, when you look at some of these, this highest number about right here, that's full. I mean, that's, Overflow. that's, that's overflowing. You know, we're getting into this, some danger zones. The dam is at risk. I mean, you're watching the dam. They're watching for leaks. They're watching for breakage. That's full, full. So you can see 1854 being way up down to 1810 in situations. I mean, you're talking, again, think of that body of water, three, four, five, six miles wide, 100 miles long. That thing's fluctuating. 10, 20, 30, 40 feet. That's a lot. It's That's as deep as some lakes, period. I remember in September of 2010, crossing the river. In order to go down to the ranch and bow hunt, I have to cross the Missouri River. And I love it. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. The water's clear. It just looks like a place that I should be. Why am I going to go sit in a tree stand? It's 85 degrees. But every day, even through October, I looked at that Missouri River, knowing that Lake Sakakawea was as high as it was, and I knew they were pumping out a lot of water. And, and I, I feel that they couldn't have pumped out more. Our elevation in Bismarck was 10 to 11 feet, and that's high coming through town. <coughs> so I knew that there was, was going to be a problem here. we got to get rid of a lot of water. And I do feel they did the best they could through October to get through as much water as they possibly could. But it obviously wasn't enough with the rains and the snow that came. And uh, so that's how we ended up in this situation. And they were, they were using the spillway. They'd opened up the spillway gates, and, and there was water gushing through, obviously. And so that's when the entrainment happened. This is where we lost the smelt. We lost the salmon. We lost the paddlefish. But the smelt was the key. That was one of the factors that when the smelt population decreases or whatever might happen to it, that's when that lake starts to suffer. And, you know, but for whatever reason, you know, we're, we ended up low here and low here. Now, this was actually up about eight to eight feet from... Uh, February of 2013. And as you can see, we started coming back. This saved Lake Sakakawea. 2014, we're at 39, 1845, 1846. You know, we're, we're, we're not very far from full pool. Right now, as of today, we're sitting at approximately 1839, which is pretty high, actually, for this time of year. And it's probably going to drop if we stay in this situation that we're in right now. But what they have to consider with that is backing a little bit of that water out and making room for winter runoff plus spring rains to, to fill that pool back up. So we have a little bit to work with, but again, it's one of those things we just don't know what's going to happen. Mother Nature dictates that body, of, that, that river, that reservoir more than, than you can ever imagine. And, and it's one of the reasons why when you're planning a trip out there, I really think you've got to pay attention to some of this. Because you have different sections of this lake. And different sections of this lake can be better on certain years than other years. There's a natural reproduction that takes place, but it's also supplemented by, by the you know, game and fish releasing fingerlings every spring as well. But they do it in certain parts, and, it, and of course it depends on, on the amount of forage available. Walleye natural reproduction is best during a high reservoir elevation, so that's obvious. You're, you have your best substrate, your best spawning habitat in the far reaches of some of these areas. Um, and it's going to happen in certain parts of this lake. But they need rock, they need gravel, they need cobble. And so the areas in this lake that don't get pounded with the waves when it's high <coughs> and that the bluff erosion isn't taking place, these are going to be the areas that are going to be the strongest. Um, the middle to upper portion, we'll show you a whole picture of this lake, seems to be best. Okay. Um, it has a different type of structure in the middle to upper portion versus the, the, the way west end or the way east end. Um, last year, there was a fair to good 2014 reproduction with success with the stocking as well. So 2014, these fish are going to have to grow, obviously. We have a real strong 2010 population, a real strong. In fact, up until last last couple years, the best population on that lake was the 2005 population. And we were catching some of these fish. They weren't as big as what I think that Kurt and I thought they should be. I, we saw something last night that was eye-opening for me anyway, and which we're going to get to as well here, maybe. We will eventually here. Um, so the current Lake Sakakawea population, Lake Sakakawea has rebounded drastically since the 2011 flood. I mean, we are doing good. Okay? 
best thing probably for us right now is if we don't gain a lot of water. Let that habitat grow, regrow, let it come back a little bit. And if we can just kind of bring it up a little each spring and let it go back down, you always wanted that 1835 range, maybe 1837. You want to go into that and come into the spring at that same range. So we have boat ramps, we have access for all the anglers. That's the goal as far as I'm concerned. Of course, I don't work for the Corps of Engineers, but if I did, that's what I would say. Um, but right now, we're pretty, we're pretty well balanced. Uh, we have a good population of walleyes. But, um, you know, a two-year-old walleye, you're looking at 14, 15 inches. And, you know, after that, you know, if you go by the data, the growth rate is quite slow. A lot slower than I ever thought it was growing up. This is going to be our strongest year class right now. These are five-year-old fish. They're the strongest. Um, probably the only, and, and they should remain strong. These fish look healthy. They're, they're, they're like little footballs. They're fat. You know, the fish that we're still catching from 2010, if they're still around, the few that are, we're talking 27 to 30 inch fish. I caught more fish in that range last year than I've caught out of that lake my entire life. But as I was mentioning to Kurt the other night, only a few of them exceeded eight pounds. But I did catch more than I've ever caught before. So there's still a few of them around, but they're dying off, they're old. They also <coughs> starved during that, that period from 2005 to 2009. So their growth rate was really stunted. So these fish never reached their potential. One thing, uh, abundance, you were showing the walleyes. The walleyes are very abundant right now. The smallmouth bass, bass are very abundant. Uh, the pike are very abundant. Those of you... I used to always think this looked like a lizard running. You know, they've got the head up here, the legs, you know. Yeah, I love that picture. I love this lake. Like many of you love the lake that you love the most, but I love it. I love looking at the maps, but I just love this one. But it does look like a lizard. You know, you can color it in, it's pretty cool. But obviously at Lake Sakakawea, and we have a great love of this. We usually start getting the east end of Lake Sakakawea. This is the east end. This is kind of what we refer to the east end. If you've heard of Douglas Bay, which is near Garrison, North Dakota, from there towards Highway 83, which runs right here. We got Lake Audubon over here, and we've got Lake Sakakawea over on this side. The, the east end of that lake is is fairly shallow. There's a lot of islands. There's a lot of places to fish. It draws a lot of people from the Bismarck area up. It draws a lot of people from the Minot area down. But it's big, as you can see. This re reservoir is huge. And when you start looking at the bays, some of these bays alone we're going to touch on, they're big enough to where you can fish that bay. That bay is as big as some of the lakes you guys fish. So that bay, you can go in and fish it for days. You can fish it for weeks. I know guys that live in Douglas Bay from ice out to August. And, and they are so good in one bay, which is fine. But I guess my point is there's so much to fish out <coughs> there. These maps are key. Your Lorance units are key because you have to figure out where your elevation is. Now start keying on the, the islands that are within the depth you want to target, which in my opinion, if you can see the, the rubble, two, three, four feet underwater, those are the ones you want to start with. And start looking at that elevation and which ones of those islands or shorelines with the, the nice points that we all know about, where they're key in that, that depth range and, and start going. One of the things that is so so frustrating but yet so awesome about this lake is like Kurt mentioned, some of these bays, some of these areas are so large that they are, I almost refer to them as a fishery within a fishery. You know, those of you that haven't been there much, from, from this island here over, it's eight miles by water. Which, you know, it's not a long ways, but it's, it's, a fair, it's a fair distance. You have to remember again, this reservoir, there is no trees around it. You don't have protection when the wind blows, you're in trouble. I mean, you got to think through a lot of this, so safety, I guess, is one thing. There's plenty of maps. You can drive around to one end of the lake if the wind's too strong out of the north. You can stay on the north side of the lake and find plenty of stuff to fish. But you got to think through that a little bit if you're traveling, coming up from the south side or the north side of the river, <coughs> and you're camping on the, the, the boat ramps are in great shape, the campgrounds are in great shape. But you got to think through some of this because it, it is fairly big open water. It is, it's rough. It can be dangerous, but you just got to use a little common sense with it. This is what I love right here. I spend hours every night doing this. This is what I love to do. You know, it's relaxing to me. But uh, this is uh, using the avionics here. This is kind of a zoomed in portion of what you just saw. Uh, here's Highway 83 right here. Okay? You can see all these shallow areas. I mean, it's endless out here. 
This is a basin, you know. It'd be like Devil's Lake and the main lake with a whole bunch of shallow islands out there. That's what it'd be similar to. But these things are incredible. It's so much fun to try to figure them out. And some are never good and others are just hot. But they all have a lot of wonderful structure around them, which we're going to show you as well. You know, but you can see here there's humps and all over the place. It is so much fun. And you can get out there and explore even on the busiest of days. There's plenty of fish. These fish are there. They're there for reasons, you know, and you have to learn. Why are they there? When they're there? You know, is it, is it the wind? Is it the weather? Is it the morning? Is it the evening? Uh, obviously, a lot of pressure. They're going to move off to the edges. But there's so, you have so many options here. You know, you can be casting crankbaits, pitching jigs. Uh, later in the year, you can be contour trolling lead along this area, live bait rigging spinners and bottom bouncers, but uh, I, I, in the evening when I'm up here and I spend a lot of time, I'm usually up there Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then I come home and mow the yard, go back up again, you know, as much as I possibly can. I split it up between my dad and my, my family, but I'll have my computer open with uh, Google, Google Earth, I, I've got my Navionics going, and, I, and I've got uh, my, my uh, contour map, my hard maps, you know. I love this stuff, and I'll compare the different <coughs> things, and it's amazing how they all kind of differ a little bit. Of course, then you rely on the memory a little bit. One, one thing you got to remember on these islands up there, if, if you're interested in this end of body of water, uh, the east end, again, very good early on. It's good all year, in fact. But those little islands up there, they're not really big. You can fish all sides of them in a short period of time. But there is always a spot within that island that's better than the others. And sometimes it might just take a slow troll around them, pitching deep, pitching shallow. Um, whatever you like to do to find that, and it, obviously you find one here, you start keying in. Okay, now I look at my maps, I see why they're hanging on this point. And now you can start comparing apples to apples. Okay, there's more islands over here, let's look for a similar structure, similar depth, and see if we can start putting the puzzle together. And then you can either eliminate some wasted time on these islands, and maybe go key on these that are all sitting about the same depth, they look like they have similar structure according to the maps. And it, again, it's just it's part of the game you play on shore in the evenings when you come off and you're doing some relaxing. We fast forward to May right now. Uh, again, we're zoomed in even further. We're on the east end. We're on some of those islands right now. You've had a decent wind all week. The weather's been pretty stable. This is where I'm going right out the path. I'm going to go find some of these islands. You bring them up on your on your Lorance unit, you rock and roll right to them, and you start fishing them. You got them right there. I mean, it's pretty easy these days. It's it's uh, Granted, it was nice in the old day, you throw a marker boy, and you go around in a circle. And you pick it up and go to the next spot, but this is the next best thing, obviously. You know, you can work around this one. And we're pitching jigs, especially in the spring. We're moving pretty good clip. We want to find fish. I'm not kidding you. Five, ten minutes, max. I'm out of there, okay? Um, in many seminars, you know, I've listened to people say, you know, a great day of fishing is so much better than working. Like, eh, no, no, I'd rather be at work. I'm out there to catch fish, and that's kind of different about me. I have no problem about it, you know. When I'm hunting, I like to shoot stuff too. It's what I'm out there to do. But so I'm out there to search and destroy. I don't relax very often. Looking at maps is the way I relax. Our relaxing is a little bit different. I yes, mean, it's, it is. It's fun, but it's I don't know. We kind of play a serious role to each other, but that's fun to us. We enjoy that. Um, kind of one, it, it's kind of the, the hunting method. You're hunting for the fish once you find them, then the relaxing, the enjoyment part. When you're all done, it's a, you know a, a well-earned day. That that's the fun part to us <coughs> when we go together. Um, to other people, it's totally different. They might want to put their boots up on the dash and just sit back there and float around. That's okay if that's what you enjoy. That's good. But like he's saying, we're out there. We're just trying to find these, and the, the biggest, the hardest part, of it, a lot of people can catch fish, it's finding them and figuring out how to do it is the hardest part. And once you've solved that puzzle, um, it, it feels so good about it. And in the spring up here, early on, May and June, you take a lot of the equation out, because like I said, you can just take your jigs and a few baits with, and the hardest part right now is maybe finding the depth. And you can figure that out real easy, just by doing a little bit of research, you see people hanging in the whatever, eight, nine, ten feet or whatever they're doing, or yourself, you really can eliminate what bait is working. You don't have to worry about that. So that, that's one part of the puzzle that's out. Kurt talked about uh, people that spend all their time in certain areas. Well, growing up, I spent all my time in Stankies. I love this bay. I love it so much, it's ridiculous. 
I get excited every time I see this. I know every nook and cranny in that place, and I just absolutely love it. But it does let me down periodically. Um, some of the things I'm always looking for is I get back here as far as I can. And I'm always looking for the structure. So we, and, and I'm looking for these magnet points right here. Water's coming up. They're going to be moving back into these fingers. They're going to go way back here. Water's dropping. They're going to hang out on these points for a little while. Um, here's another look at oh, went the wrong way. Here's another look at that same area. One of my favorite points in Stangies. Um, this is what I'm looking for in the spring of the year. Um, these fish aren't as affected by the weather at this time. You know, it's either it's most likely post spawn. These things are out there to eat. And this is what I'm looking for right here. I like these long, shallow points where it drops off into some deep water. But I can get up in here and I can pitch these things. There's a road bed over here. There's so much structure back in these bays. Now, during a real low water year, not going to be the same. But the last couple of years, these areas have been hot. And you know what's really strange is I can oftentimes be back there on the most busiest of weekends. And Oh, you might see a boat scattered about. You know, it's one of those days where, I mean, we've all had them. You're catching fish so fast, you're like, you just got to get the next one. You, you, you're worried that people are going to hone in on you, you know, which is not a big deal. You know, I'll probably just tell the next guy right there, this is probably my hair. I'll just go there and fish. Really? Yeah. You know. Um, but this is what I'm looking for. I love this stuff right here. Okay. Spring of the year, May, June. And I'm probably going to go there in July as long as the water's coming up. Water dropping, yeah, they're going to start pulling all these bays pretty quick. Uh, this reservoir too is notorious for about the time you think you got something figured out, it kind of kicks you in the rear and it sets you back. It's like there's no reason these fish should not be here. And I'll, I remember two years ago, in the spring, just like he said, starting to work back in there. And those fish should have been there, and they should have, and they should have, but they weren't, and they weren't, and they weren't. Coming out of the bay, moving over to the next one, accidentally stumbled on a shallow island, and like I so said, I just happened to see it right at the right time, thank goodness. Started fishing it, bada bing, they were there. Okay, so that spring, those fish didn't, and the water levels were telling you that they should be there. They should have been back there, but they weren't. And for most of the spring, a lot of the Sakakawea fish stayed on the outer perimeters of these bays and were just right outside either points on the outsides of the bays, the main lake, um, and some of the sunken islands right around there. So. It's not always tradition. We know that we can't always count on fishing being exactly the same. Every time we think we know it, like I said, we get we get proven wrong. I'm going to back up a couple slides here. This is one of the points that I spend most of my time fishing right here in Stanky Bay. Here it is again now, okay? And here it is again with the Navionics. And a lot of the time, this is my hot spot. Now, the last few years, because of the, the drought in, the, in between 2005 and 2009, this area here grew up with cottonwoods. It's lined with cottonwoods. And I've actually been waiting, you know, hey, we got high water. We might as well break these trees down. I've been waiting for these to break down. Finally, last year, I could get in here in this two, three, four foot of water, and it was just an absolute mess of fish in there, casting cranks, casting jigs. You lost a lot of stuff because there's still a lot of trees in here. But you could get in there where people absolutely did not want to go, and it was amazing. But one thing nice about this particular point is when these fish are really <coughs> active and aggressive, they're going to be up here. They like to hang out here, and there's a rock pile right here. But after a slight cold front moves through, they slip around to this side over here, where you see the contours are much closer together and drops off. And so you kind of got to, you've got a great place here. You've got a place where these fish are up feeding hard. They're up in here where they're easy to locate. This year is going to be real easy because, again, we've got high water. Um, this is my favorite area to be because it seems like I can pitch in many directions, whereas on this side, but this is a great place after a cold front. And, and for me, after a cold front, and I think it fools most of us, at least me for a lot of years until I figured it out. Fishing was hot. You go home for a day or two, and you come back, and it's those perfect, beautiful days. 73 <coughs> degrees, exactly. And light winds, clear sky, and you can't wait to get here. There's nothing there, nothing at the next spot, nothing, nothing, nothing. And that's where you, if you didn't realize you're fishing after a cold front, you're probably going to be going home thinking, you know, at least we weren't at work. And if you're me, it's like, I wish I would have been at work, you know? But that's where you want to look at some of these areas like this. You want to have a backup plan. And this is what I search for. It's my backup. This is aggressive area here. 
This is pole front area over here. And it works most of the time. Those of you guys that pitch a lot of jigs, you know, those, those, those gradual contours, whether you're pitching in the shallow or deep and vice versa, bringing your jig to and fro the boat either direction, it's real nice to do that. When you get to those steeper areas, it seems awkward, but you can't pass those up in situations like that. A lot of times those fish are there, you take one hop with your jig and it goes from three feet down to 10 feet, you know, and then down to 15 feet and wherever else you are. You can't pass those situations up <coughs> if you like to cast jigs. You can vertical jig on these spots also. It's sometimes a little easier, but short pitches from J to I, just pitch it out there, a couple hops, but they take drastic drops, you know, from zero down to 12 or 15 feet, but those fish are there. Mm -hmm. Again, you can't pass those situations up. And I love to troll lead coil. My favorite, though, is probably in that 12 to 18 foot range, to be honest with you. And sometimes after these coal fronts, where these uh, contours are really close, I love to troll small baits on lead through here, burn them through here, wrap around here. I love that. So it's just another option or opportunity. But as long as I can catch some pitching jigs, I'm going to do that first for casting crankbaits. Uh, Kurt was talking about Douglas Bay earlier. Um, pretty well-known bay, and those of you that have been there, this is a monster, you know. To me, this is a fishery all in its own. Uh, it, it, it has everything you can possibly imagine, from spring, summer, fall, winter, early ice, mid-ice, late ice. There's trolling spots in there, everything. there's jigging spots in there, there's live baiting spots in there, there's weeds in there, there's rocks in there, there's sharp points, there's deep drop-offs, there's nice contours. Like he said, anything and everything is inside of that thing. And learning that bay alone is, that's a lifelong thing. It is. Most yeah. of us don't spend enough time on a body of water to, to get to know a big reservoir, much less that, that little big bay right there itself. You know, prior to 2005, I spent most of my time in the east end, midsection, and the west. I stayed out of Douglas. This place frustrated me. But when we lost all the water around that 2005 era, you know, I, I just decided, okay, we're going to have to figure this bay out. I love this bay now just about as much as I love Stanky. But now I have two wonderful places to go. But like Kurt was mentioning, I was fishing a tournament here last year. And I was working in an area. We had a, had a good friend of mine from Minot, North Dakota. He and his buddy were trolling deep reef runners with snap weights. I could have probably thrown a baseball to them. We had guys running lead core and small flicker shads. And well, I mean, we're right close to, we had guys live bait, <coughs> guys pulling spinners and bottom bouncers. I'm on the inside of the trees pitching eggs in, in four to six foot of water. Uh, we were catching fish, they were catching fish. It was just a matter of, please don't let them catch the big fish. I want the big fish. So it was kind of this crap shoot, you know? But, uh, but you have so many of these areas. This is just a, go ahead. One, one thing to remember, in these bays, whether it's Stanky Bay, Douglas, to me, it has a little bit more of this in it. You can see all the fingers, all the bays, all the trick channels coming in here. If you go out there in May, June, July, and that reservoir is climbing, you can weasel your way all the way to the back. I mean all the way until you run out of water and start pushing <coughs> these fingers outward. As long as that water is coming up, don't be afraid to go back in. You're going to see boats scattered. There are so many good... Um, these spots are notorious for, for boats, for fish. They've been good, they've been proven, but don't be afraid to snake all the way back into these cricks and then start popping points or even just some, some straight edge, some weed lines coming out. Again, just troll through it, whether you like to troll lures or troll and cast your pitch your jigs. Whatever it happened to be, do not be afraid to dig back in the, the depths of those. If we stay average or above rainfall, these areas are gonna be hot. We were, this past year, we were going up in you know, I remember as a kid watching the Bassmasters, you know, and they're getting through these wooded areas, and maybe some of you have done this on Devil's Lake where you're bouncing off one log, but you can't go too slow, you're getting stuck in the log. You know, that's kind of like what it was like back here. I remember Dad looking at me, he said, this can't be a good idea. I, said, I know, but damn, there could be a lot of fish back there, you know. You're right, it was not probably a good idea. You got barbed wire fences, you got all kinds of yeah. stuff back there, but there sure were a lot of fish back there for a period of time. They didn't stay there as long as we needed them, but it is amazing at what comes back in here. Um, this is kind of a zoomed in version of one of these creek arms. This creek arm actually snakes around and goes quite a ways back in here. But once again, using the maps, you're looking at a particular spot. You got a long point coming out over here. You see how tight these uh, contours over here. This is one of those great magnetic spots again. It's fantastic, it's everything. These fish are up here feeding, you can get up here and work your way. It doesn't matter what you do. Casting and pitching is going to be best because we're shallow. 
And then if it's one of those tough days, maybe after a cold front, you've got this area to rely on. You might have to go to your live bait rigs, trolling spinners, lead core in your small baits. You can snake around the other side. This gets a little tricky over here because it starts to get shallow over in this area. So, you know, if you don't have a good wind blowing in over there, it's not going to be as, as good as it is over here. One thing that we did in this particular situation is in, instead of going, obviously we got a sheet of ice, but we got maps to look at. Plus, we got our mind to remember from open water fishing, we used this spot to pick a spot to, to ice fish this past year, and it worked to our advantage 100%. We remembered what it looked like. We remembered where it was. We went right in there and, and dropped our tip-ups and had a fantastic day of, of pike fishing. Just because we knew what it was from years before, from the maps, from being in there, from investigating. So try and remember that stuff. Again, use your maps all winter long. They, 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 they do wonders. In fact, this particular trip that Kurt's talking about, Kurt opened up his Google Maps on his phone. We had no idea how to get here by land. In fact, it wasn't even that easy. But with this Google Maps on his phone, it led us right there. In fact, I want to say we parked on the shore right there, and we fished this whole stretch. And it was incredible. And this is incredible. You can, be, you can cast for pike through this area. You can be casting for walleyes through this area. It will hold strong as long as the water's at least slowly increasing. As soon as it starts to drop, these fish are going to pull out. That's where you want to be right here. It's like this is an extreme magnet once again. Everything, as soon as they feel that elevation drop, that fr pressure, it, it, it's, I, I think somebody explained it to me, a scientist or somebody, it's like taking bread and start, you know, and, and closing the bag but pushing pressure on it. It, it, it. These fish can feel this, but they will hang out here, and they will take all the bait that's coming out of here with it. And it's, a, it's just a great, great spot once again. Um, you know, we, we spend the majority of our time probably on the east end of spring. And then this is what I guess we would consider the midsection. Um, if you're familiar with the area at all, you have Beaver Bay in this area, you have Nishu, uh, some other ones, Renner Bay, you have Dakota Waters, Indian Hills. It's a great place because you got some great campgrounds in this area. The fishing here can change now. Um, you might have to drop down a little deeper <coughs> on a year if the water's low or if the elevation is decreasing or it's on the, the downside. But if you have water coming up like the past few years, again, you can head right back into some of these areas right there. In that area, I guess I would recommend people, if you want to travel out there in June or July, that's a great area to like to visit. Again, Jason said, great campgrounds, boat ramps, uh, plenty of people to, to feed off information, you know, get some tips, find the depth, that type of thing. Again, the bays are there. Uh, the baits he mentioned on there do the exact same thing, whether it's June or July. If that water's still coming up, I don't care if it's hot out. If you, if you see it coming up, do not be afraid to go back into the very, very, very tips of those bays. Again, casting crankbaits is a good, good op, and, and doing some jigging back there, trolling, it, it all works in there that time of year. But that midsection of the lake, um, that June, July stuff is, is always good. That Nishi Bay that I was just, we were just looking at here, uh, Beaver Bay. So these are some of your go-to. So if you're going to make a trip out there, you know, find out where Nishi is. Find out where Beaver is. These are two great places. Lots of other great bays. This is a real productive area. And again, you can be trolling in 60 feet of water with with uh, deep running crankbaits and lead core and snap weights. You can be live bait rigging. You can be trolling spinners. I like to do a lot of lead core with a shallower deep. But what really gets me excited about this area, especially the last couple years, is I love to cast crankbaits. Now, Lake Sakakawi is not really known for casting crankbaits, but the last couple years has been phenomenal at times. You have to hit the day just right. I'm fortunate to be up there enough so that will happen. But uh, so these are some of my favorites. Uh, probably the Flicker Shad last year was my best. And when I'm, when I'm casting crankbaits, it's not necessarily just going along the shoreline and doing it like, like I've done in many lakes. Um, some places along Devil's Lake, I just cruise and, and I'm casting, casting, casting. I'm looking for these same types of points. I want weed growth about two feet under the surface, maybe two to four feet under the surface, and I want my crankbaits to go over the top of that. I want to find an area where I can actually cast that crank completely and well over the point. So I'm bringing it from deep water and I'm bringing it across those points. But last year was one of those magical years. If I could just have another year, it was my absolute best year of casting crankbaits. I've never experienced anything like that in that lake, but for whatever reason, whether it was the, the forage we have, the vegetation that was there at the time, 
but uh, I do enjoy doing a lot of that too. But again, I enjoy keeping it shallow and, and trying to keep it as simple as possible. There's a close-up version of the issue again. Way back, you can see the crits running into these things. Get back in there, that's where the crankbaits come in handy. That's where the jigs come in handy. If you find those weed beds, which there's going to be weeds back there, no question about it. You just got to find ways to work around them, either inside and right on the edges or right over the tops of them. I like to start working these real back fingers here, these way far branches. I like to do it into, well, end of June, but primarily around the 4th of July. That's when I really start keying on it. It seems like the water's warming up back there. Again, we need to have the water rising. But uh, last year, I spent a lot of time right here, and as you can see, there's no water there right now. Um, there's a little finger that's showing dry right there, and I would, I would use my Minkota down your anchor right there, and that was a hot spot. But you can see, I found these areas because of, of using different maps. Uh, a real key area is this point right here. I don't think you'll find it on Navionics, pretty sure you won't, and I don't think you'll find it on any contour map, but that one right there, is a, that's a hot. This is the one where, when I talk about casting a crankbait completely over it, this is, this is what you want to look for right here. And there's others, another one right there. But that seems to be what the key is up there. Sometimes paralleling the structure, but <coughs> for whatever reason, if you can cast completely over it, you know, it's, it's very possible you're pulling fish from deeper water, and they see that crankbait, and before it gets to the weeds, they hit it, and you're taking fish right out of the weeds. Uh, and it could have been the forge, but whatever reason, casting crankbaits in that lake last year was incredible. Um, here's a zoomed in, closer look of that tree farm I was telling you about. There's that point that I was telling you about. One of my favorite spots last year. And uh, last time this map was updated, it was dry. And it's probably pretty dry right now, too. But again, you can see these, these points. Now, here's the other thing. When you're working these back fingers like this, and I'm sure it's the same most any lake or reservoir, uh, what happened here is we got on these fish. And not, I haven't seen people back here in three days. It was pretty incredible. And it was everywhere you went. You couldn't hardly go anyplace. Without, it was just a heyday. But then we had a day with winds that were 40 miles an hour from the northwest. Okay? Northwest is that direction. And what started happening is it started draining this finger. Well, the day of the wind, it was hot. Because every fish back in this, this, the shallowest water, they <coughs> wanted to get the heck out of here. So everybody piled back in here to get out of the wind. And it was like, ah, oh, no, that was the worst thing that could possibly happen. I snuck around this corner to look at all these boats. Well, then of course everybody thought fishing was great, which it had been. But what happened is the water started dropping, and the wind was forcing it out of there, these fish evacuated this area. And they were pretty much gone compared to the way it had been for quite some time. But now on the other hand, on the other side of the bay, as that northwest wind was filling, was emptying this, it was filling up some of these other creek arms. I didn't necessarily in a tournament figure it out until day two. I went back to my, my number two spot and that's what had happened. These fish had all filtered back up into there. So using your maps, paying attention to the elevation is a real big key, I think, on this lake. Here's a picture of that point where I said if you, you try to cast the cranks over it, again, this is what I'm looking for. I like this point right here. If you can find it, you need to have the right water. You could have low water year, this is gone. Then you've got to look elsewhere. But that's what I like about the Google Maps. You know, we've got a lot of these situations too where you can get out there and you just go for miles, which is really nice about the midsection of this lake. You control, they have nice flats. You can, again, do whatever you want. Not necessarily a great place for casting jigs unless you've got wind blowing in there. Great place for you know getting out there. I like to run lead in this area if I can. I'm in and out all the time. Probably one of the most favorite things that I've been doing the past few years, especially with my daughters with, is I do a lot of open water trolling with spinners. I, I get them set so they're down about anywhere from 20 to 27 feet, and I just rock and roll with them. I run four rods. Um, I haven't been running a lot with planer boards just because I got the kids with me, um, but I'll go anywhere from 20 to 35 feet and we've just been having heydays. It's something that should be done a lot more in that lake. You know, a lot of guys are trolling crankbaits, but uh, this is just another method that gets done a lot of places, especially I'm sure the lakes you guys fish, but it doesn't happen a lot where you're just out there, you're working suspended fish. You know, they're not really suspended. These fish are coming off the bottom five, 10 feet, but uh, you'll get some that are suspended once in a while. Now we're up into the band hook arm, which is a whole new animal of its own. I mean, that place up there, one of the pictures we have, you're gonna see you can see all the little islands. I mean, some of them are a little faint. If you know that body of water, that is one of the best bodies of water in the in the state of North Dakota for for the last 20, 30, 50 years. I mean, consistently the Van Hook Arm produces great fish. Number one, you have the river coming right out in there. This is, in my opinion, 
uh, it's a flat part of the lake compared to the rest of it. But there's a lot of islands out there. There's a lot of sand out there. If you like to troll, if you like to drift, if you like to live bait, that's the place you want to go. The only thing you got to fight is the people. It's a very popular area. It, it, it gets a lot of people from, from the Minot area. There's campgrounds. There's areas up there where the people flock to. But it is a dynamite place to be. Anywhere from just the south end of what you're looking at all the way up to the tip of that thing, it, it, it's an incredible <coughs> fishery up there. And yeah. it, it is going to be again this year. An, an incredible place to fish. And it's so easy. You want to take a group of people up here, you can drift for a, a mile. There's very few snags up in this area. A lot of sand, a lot of islands out there. It's easy to find the fish. There's boats out there. A lot of islands right up here in the arm. And again, when that water warms up, this place just gets absolutely hot. You know, I don't know. How, how many of you spent a lot of time up here in the, in the Van Hook Arm? Okay. It is just, it's, it's so much fun. I just love it up there because it's like, I don't have to worry about it points anymore that much. I just, just get out. This is where I have fun. This is where my fun area. If I want to get out and troll deep running crankbaits, uh, throw out reef runners, work anywhere from 25 to 60 feet, this is where I'm going to do it. I love it. It's so much fun up here. You can go shallow up here. You know, you can be fishing 60 feet the same day, and then you just move in if there's good wind, especially down on this side of the lake. It's been my most productive in shallow water. I'll fish anywhere from two. I like 3.7 feet. Don't ask why, but I love to troll crankbaits. Uh, shallow running crankbaits at 3.7 feet seems to be my my uh, my lucky number for whatever reason. But I spent a lot of time right in this area doing that. And you can actually put in a partial here. There's no reason you would start the big engine if you got a kicker. Start trolling. You know, it's this is a troller's paradise. It's just a big basin. It's it's absolutely incredible. You know, so I'll just kind of end before we talk a little bit about the river, the Missouri River. Um, obviously, the fishery, uh, Lake Sakakawea, is in good shape right now. It has rebounded since the 2011 flood. It has rebounded since the 2005-2008 the drought situation. Our walleye population is good. The pike is abundant. If you love to cast for pike, I mean, it, it's very common to catch 40 to 60 pike in an outing casting uh, spinner baits on this lake. Um, you know, you got to figure it out. You got to find them. It's amazing. I mean, on clear days, when the wind's not blowing into the, that, that structure and into the weeds and the trees, these big pike come out and they'll be out about 15, 20 feet and they're down about two, three feet and you just see them swimming along. You know, it's pretty cool. Um, smallmouth bass fishery is, is hot right now. The, so the soccer population is doing okay. It's not like it was in the you know, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and I don't know if it's ever going to be back like that. We, we need a much stabler situation. Forage is good, you know, so basically it's going to be another great year on Lake Sakakawea. And you have the boat ramp situation should be good. Everything's going to be looking good out there. Well, one thing I would probably recommend, um, uh, early on, I guess I would, say, I would say from past experiences, you have better chances at catching more consistent, nicer fish. I'm going to say 17 to 22, 23 inch fish, pretty consistent. Late May through the month of June. As summer comes around, things start to go like this. You'll start getting a mix of small fish. You'll catch a, your, your bigger fish, your mid-size, but you have chances at, at even more of your, your whatever, 27, 28 inches. You get a mixed bag towards the summer. Summer can, the, the spring fish in the early season can be a little tougher, meaning you might only go out and catch 10 to 15 or 20 or something, where in the summer, I'm going to call June and July, late June and July, you can go out and catch 30, 40, 50, 60 of them. You might catch a lot of small ones out there. So depending what you're looking to do, you want to catch a lot of fish, you want to catch some nicer ones, I would say the nicer, more consistent stuff would be early in the season. Towards summer, you're going to get your mixed bag. Um, you got chances at, at having great days, and you might have uh, some chances at some pretty tough days too. You have to move around on that reservoir. If you are not in them, don't watch the boats. Get out of there. If you're fishing the north side of the lake, you've checked back in the bays. You've hit the, the points on the north side. You've checked some, some deep water, some shallow. Bail out, cross the lake, and try the south side. Some days, don't ask me why, it just happens. You know, you, you're not really relying on yesterday's wind or today's wind. Sometimes just switching sides of that lake or reservoir just get to the other side and start fishing. I don't know why some days it makes a difference. You know, and, and we, this happens every year, but I can tell you one thing that can happen and does happen off that lake. It can be, and it can be after a, a terrible wind, but it can be on the north shore. It can be 
54 degrees. On the south shore, it can be 65 degrees. And if you don't figure that out fast enough, it can be a tough day of fishing, you know. And, and what's also strange is oftentimes the south side of that lake, calm conditions are as good as anything, you know. But you do have the river channel running along a lot, lot of the south side of that lake. So those fish can also be there <coughs> one day and gone the next. I was on a school of fish that was probably three quarters of a mile long for almost five days. And it was crazy. But when they were gone, they were gone. You know, and, and the majority of the time, the dead calm days were the absolute best. I have no idea. They weren't deep, uh, but it was not it was not too far from Pig City, North Dakota, but it was almost a three-quarter mile long stretch. And let me tell you, it was just fish after fish after fish in the graph. You could catch them any way you wanted. The average was 16, 17 inches with some 18s mixed in, but was it fun? But when it ended, it never happened again. I have no idea why they were there. It could have been water temperature. It could have been weather. I'm not sure. It might have been smell. The smell might have been hanging close enough at that point. But uh, it that, could... that reservoir is really no different than any other lake when it comes to using your electronics. Trust them when you see them. When you see them, you're going to find them. Most of, a lot of times, you're going to catch them. Where Jason and I grew up fishing the river, I don't use my electronics to find fish on the river. I use it to navigate, to <coughs> tell me depth. The river is shallow. We fish shallow. All, I, it's a totally different animal. So the, the, the lake, the reservoir up there is totally different than for him and I in a, in a river situation, and we'll touch on that too here real quick too. You know, normally we come out here and we tell you all about the river, you know, how wonderful the river is. I'm, I'm fortunate to have grown up on that thing, and, and Kurt has too. Um, I've been negative about that river since the flood. I've done a number of numerous radio shows, and, and I, I just did another one the other day, and you know I was pretty negative. It's unfortunate. <laughs> And, and I said on that radio program, I will do anything if everybody proves me wrong. But, and, and we're not biologists, we're going by personal experience here. And I think we, we had a conversation the way down, and we may have figured something out just a little bit. And I think the Game and Fish can back us on this. Um, but right now, the fall data, and this is coming from the Game and Fish, some of their data, so it's kind of mixed in here. Um, there's, a, there's an extreme lack of forage from Garrison Dam to just south of Bismarck. Now, south of Bismarck, that could be a few miles, and it could be 20 miles south. So I, that part I can't quite tell you, but there's something been going on. And I think for the past few years, I've blamed it a little bit on bad weather, snowstorms, dirty water. It's been a terrible spring the last three years. But something's not working, and something's not adding up. I love this, this river so darn much, and, and on a daily basis, I'm trying to figure this out. It bugs me that much. But doing a little research uh, this winter, you know, I'm finding out that there is an extreme lack of forage. And so I'm thinking, why? Because I've been expecting these fish to kind of move up that are hanging south of Bismarck. Things are starting to improve down there a little bit, but why aren't we seeing it on the river? I grew up, I should be able to go to the same spot and catch fish. Well, when, in 2011, when we flooded, it, it would be very similar to taking a scoop shovel and just going across your cornfield and taking the top 10 feet off and then trying to plant corn the next year. It's not going to happen. I just don't think it's going to. Okay. Um, and that's basically what's happened. That river came through with such force, it just scooped up all that sand. And as soon as it started dropping, this, the, the river level, it dropped that sand. But if you've been up there recently, if you've fished in the past, we have sand dunes. <coughs> you know? And we were talking on the way up, and, and, and from the surface above, the river looks like, and I was guilty of saying this in 2012, on another radio program, I said, you know what? I think she's returned. It's going to take some time, but she's back. The only thing I've not done is spent any time below the surface. And now it's starting to add up. All the sand is piled up from, let's say, just south of Bismarck to the Garrison Dam tailways. And unfortunately, it's of no use to the river itself. We're missing all the water bugs and all the different, different water animals that use the sand and the ripples in the sand as their home. Those were, were the, that, those, those other animals, the bugs, the, the whatever, the water bugs, that was the food for the forage fish. Right now, we don't have the forage fish. We don't have the walleyes in that area anymore either. Now, you can go out there and have some good days. There's always going to be a window, even on the worst year, of nice fish in the spring on that, on that river from Bismarck North. But it's starting to almost make sense. And, it, and it's kind of amazing. It took a drive out here. He's in his truck, I'm in my truck, we're on the phone. And thinking, you know, that's starting to make sense. Because south of Bismarck, we have a different situation. 
So right now, from the Garrison Dam to just south of Bismarck, we are still suffering badly. And I, I did a little more inquiry into this, and because Kurt even asked, he said, well, how long until it comes back? And, and I said, generations, possibly. And he said, what does that mean? I feel bad to say 10 to 20 years. I hope I'm wrong. It might only be five. But it's going to take some time. And that is disappointing, because we love that river. Now, south of Bismarck is showing some, some improvement. Okay? It is showing some improvement. And, and that's where we're going to say from the, the headwaters of Lake Hawaii. And I don't know where we're at right now, but let's say 5, 10 miles south of Bismarck to the state line. We're improving there. Uh, there are some fair populations of fish from Mulbridge to uh, Cattail Bay. The state line, Cattail, Fort Yates, it's really showing some positive signs. We're recovering there nicely. In fact, right now, we've got a really, really solid population of 2013 fish. So we're going to see a good number of 14 to 16 inch fish. We've got great numbers of fish coming through the ice right now. The last two falls have been pretty good down there. In fact, you get down to the Fort Yates area in the spring, you can have some extraordinary catches of walleyes. Cattail Bay, Beaver Dick Bay, the State Line Resort area down in Mulbridge. It's, it's really recovered well. You've got a shallower area. The, the sand deposited the way it needed to down in that area. It didn't rush through and drop real fast like it did up in Bismarck. Picture a, a tunnel or, you know, a, or a small trough, and that's what happened where we were. When the water started dropping, it dropped too fast from Bismarck north. And when it did, it dropped there with the sand in piles. So above the surface, things look good. Below the surface, we're not doing good. Um, but right now, from what I can gather, um, Lake Hawaii lost a lot of reproduction habitat. Not a lot of people know that that particular part of, of the Missouri Reach from Lake Hawaii uh, down to Pier, uh, that is, that is, the, the Missouri River is sustained by natural reproduction. Uh, it's not stocked, okay? The Lake Hawaii is recovered. Um, it's shallower, it's warmer. The 2014 walleye reproduction was really successful. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's a 2009 walleye year class that's really good, okay, right now. So they should be 14, 16. That might even be off a little bit. I gotta check on that. But I can tell you that we have a good population of fish down there. So if you're gonna come down to the Bismarck area, go south. Okay. I, I would recommend the same thing. And not trying to steer anybody away from anything. Just expect tougher conditions that you have through some of our glory years down there from the flood up till now. Things are a lot tougher, no question about it. Is there fish there? Yes. Is there nice fish there? Yes. Some days you gotta work a lot harder to get them. Some days it's, it's tough as all get out. I mean, Okay, tournament days, you go to your best spots. We do anyway. You know, you do all this stuff prior to that. Tournament days, we're landing nine fish. I think last year we voted nine <coughs> on, our, on one of the, the, the biggest tournaments out on the river. In, um, in pre-flood, you're talking 40 to 60 plus fish. A lot of them. So, and, and we have better days in that pre-fishing and post-tournaments, you know, post -tournaments. but I guess, as a general thing, it's going to be a lot tougher. Don't expect it to be as good as it was, but there are guys having great days. To do it consistent all spring is what's going to be hard. I, I think the consistency on the Missouri River is going to be tougher. Just expect things, you know, just don't expect this. I guess I'd probably say come into it down here and hope like heck you get those days where um, you, you have a banner day. And again, on that river, you have to move, 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 and move smart. Give your Give yourself a few minutes in each spot, 5, 10, 15 minutes. If that don't work, go to the next one. Then go to the next one and go to the next one. Keep going. Always keep going. The good news again, south of Bismarck, that Hazelton area, south to the state line, down through Mulbridge, you know, it's recovering. Slowly, but it's recovering. Uh, you're going to have some great fishing days. So if you want to come out to the river, you know, hang out in Bismarck area, but fish down south. That's what, what I would recommend. And if you guys have any questions, comments, or, or, or whatnot about coming that way in the West, feel free. You can contact either one of us via email, Facebook, whatever you want to do. We'd be happy to point you in a direction. Uh, maybe save yourself a little bit of homework. Um, you know, we're there. We're there every day, you know, depending on the weather, three, four days a week, we're out there trying to do something and we spread ourselves from south of Bismarck through Bismarck. Um, and then obviously this year, I'm about betting by, by mid-April, I'm gonna start going up to the reservoir on weekends and just you know spend my April, or late April, May and June up there for sure. But you never know, like, like he said, I hope we're wrong about some of this stuff. But 
again, all we can do as fishermen is speculate what might happen, and let's hope for the best. Anybody have any questions out there? Yes, sir. So when you were, I haven't fished the river since pre-flood, and being a Minnesota guy, I'm used to rainy river type fishing where on a rainy you've got to anchor up a kick. Mm -hmm. If you go to the Missouri River, that, when we were there, that didn't work. You had to slip with the current, and <coughs> you tended to catch a lot more fish. If you were slipping with the current, you had to anchor it up. Is that still the case after oh, You know, anchoring has always been great on that river. We don't do it a lot. Probably more than anything, we, we troll with our, our Minn Kotas against the current in those slack areas, and, and we'll pitch on the way up, or drag jigs on the way up, you know, horizontal jig, and we'll slip back pitch at the same time. But anchoring is great. We'll use the anchor feature on the Minn Kota, and I, that's, that's what I love, especially if I'm by myself. I use the anchor feature, run to the back of the boat, and fish back there, and think, you know, this is kind of fun. But no, anchoring is a, a great way, especially if you're not used to fishing the river. One, one thing that I think uh, was, was a little, as I was growing up, Everybody thought that right at ice out, you had to be not moving. Um, you had to be in one spot, very slow, very this. Most of the time, I guess at this point in my life, I'd probably disagree with that. Yeah, you might have to go slow, but not that slow. Because at ice out, we're doing the exact same thing we are that day as we are doing a month later. You might have to slow your, your presentation down a little bit, or hold it, or pause it. But we still cover water. You know, we just, Jason and I jig a little bit different than each other. And that's a good thing because sometimes it helps one of us figure out, I'll never forget the one day, things were pretty tough. We got into a spot, it ended up being deeper. It was 14 to 16 feet. The only way we could get those fish to bite, now this was literally, it was so cold that day, everything iced up, the minnow bucket froze, the water in the boat on the side, everything froze. So it, it was cold. But the only way we could get those fish to bite was every hop we made with our jig, we had to pause it for a second. Where for him, that was probably pretty tough, because he's more aggressive than I am. But I think he caught the first one. We, it just started going back and forth. It took a couple fish to figure it out. That day, it worked awesome. Most of the time, we don't have to slow down that much, but that day, it made a difference. We still cover water from ice out all the way through. Um, just be thorough, cover the depths, and try and figure out what depth again they're in, and, and again, anchoring is not bad, but you, you pigeonhole yourself to one spot. That's the bad thing about it. If they aren't there, pick up the anchor, slip down the bar a little bit more, drop it, and try and cover it again. Because most of the time on that river, those fish are gonna bite within minutes. Of your bait being there, the guy that casts to that spot first, that fish ain't gonna pass it up 10 times, and the 11th time it comes, he's gonna bite. That don't happen. When that jig gets in front of his face or wherever the first time it's gone, 90% of the time you're going to catch a fish in a spot within the first five, ten minutes you're there, for sure. The other thing about that river is, and, and you learn this by watching the water levels, it's cold. If anyone can get to the dam, you can get out there bright and early, but if that water happens to be still dropping a little bit, you're going to go to your number one spot because you were there last night and it was hot, and you're in there, and you might go anchor up on the top end of it, and you're not going to catch the fish, and you have to slip down to find them. Those fish pull out of those slack or current areas, and they'll start using the current, and they feel it. And sometimes in the afternoon, the opposite. The water might be coming up towards 4 or 5 o'clock, so when you're getting out there afterward, those fish are moving up into those great spots. And so that's why in the evening you're doing so good here, or at noon you're doing so good here. It depends on how consistent they are. In the last few years, they haven't been consistent about a whole lot of anything. But uh, it, it's nice when they are. I think the biggest thing people are going to notice, if you've spent any time on that river at all, just going to your favorite place pre-2011 from, from just south of Bismarck, 10 miles all the way north, you're going to find that I could go on Easter weekend every year, I could go to a particular spot, and it was going to be a slaughter. That's just the way it was. It was great. We always knew. It didn't matter if it was raining, snowing, windy. You went. But now that's not the case. And a lot of it has to do with what we lost and, and at the bottom and that sand isn't there. We need to redistribute that sand. That, that sand, what he said earlier, those sandbars are 10, 15 feet tall out of the water. I mean, they're dunes, some of them. Just on the south end of Bismarck, some of these things are huge. Where the big curves in the river are, all that sand got pushed to the outside. These sandbars are ginormous. And they never were like that. My entire life I've been on that river for 30, 40 years. I've never seen them like this. Yeah, there are still your traditional ones out in the middle that are there, 
But some of these dunes are just, they're, they're huge. I've never seen it in my life at, at all like that. And it's going to take a while for the wind, for the erosion, to push that stuff back in and start silting back in on the bottom. It depends on how long. Yeah. But it's why I think we've scratched our heads the last few years, because we go to these traditional spots that are just so incredibly good. You know it as a river fisherman. You can see it. You don't need electronics on the river. Once you, you grow up on it, you can sight fish. You don't need to run a river with electronics. Uh, but you get in these areas, it's just like, what in the world? And, and we're going, you know, a number of years since 2011 now, and it's still not working. But the drive out here, things are starting to make sense to me. We're, we're, we're missing forage fish. They don't have food, you know. The only one thing I can't explain is anybody that spent any time in that river will tell me, but what about the schools of bait fish we've been seeing in the spring? Mm. So there's one dilemma I have. That I haven't figured out yet, because we are. Last year, in uh, end of April, early May, there were schools of bait fish. What they were, I don't know. They were the young of year something. What they're doing there, I don't know, but the fish weren't necessarily there. I don't know if they're coming up and they're leaving, if they're going up into these creeks and not come back into the river. That was the, the only thing I have not figured out, and I would have to ask Game of Fish in that one. But some of this is starting to make sense. So if you do head out that way, if you want to hang around Bismarck, you know, we've had some great fishing days in Bismarck. It's just, if you'd fished there in the past, it's not quite like what you expected. Go south right now, enjoy what's down there, because the fishing will continuously get better down there, as long as we don't run into a severe drought situation. Any other questions out there? Way more data than you probably want. Yes? You identified the first structure. Um, he, he asked, you know, we were, we were talking about the, the structure after a cold front. Uh, presentation, sometimes slow down, but uh, honestly for me, my best presentation after a cold front is these fish move to this, this steep drop-offs. I love lead core and small crankings. And, and it doesn't matter whether it's 10, 12 feet or, or 25, 30 feet. That's been my best. But I'll still do a lot of live bait with bottom bouncers. I, I'm probably not using jigs as often there. It's because I'm, it, it seems like it's more during July, and, and these fish are kind of scattered about. But if I can contour troll this with lead, and uh, I don't do it with lead and spinners a whole lot, but lead, lead and small crankbaits. But that's kind of been my best. But I'll still run bottom bouncers, and, uh, and, uh, and a snell vary the length anywhere from you know three to 10 feet, depending on where I'm at, and leeches, crawlers, whatever. Um, spinners still work, but I might have to slow down. But it's more or less trying to figure out where these fish are. But they seem, for me, on Lake Sakakawea, they really relate to that, that sharp drop. You know, then I don't find them suspended so much as I do. They might be away from that drop a little bit, you know, but they're just hanging on that edge. I think they feel safe there, you know. But after a severe cold front, I'll try to find the area where what that it was good last Saturday, for example, and I'll try to find that area where they're going to retreat to. They're going to go hide out there. They feel safe for some reason, you know. And there's definitely areas in that lake over the years where that's worked. I can go back to that spot, and those fish seem to be there, you know. And oftentimes, if I'm really working hard, I'm fishing the tournament, and you know they're not always there. On that day. But uh, and, and that's where the maps have come in handy. And I'll write some of this stuff down. And, and again, it's it's no different than a guy that loves golf or a woman that loves golf. You know, they take the golf game pretty serious. I, I know some of these people. You know, I I I've, I've purchased some golf equipment in the last few years. I bought these tees. You know, but um, you know they get into this stuff too. You know, but with the fishing, I love to do this stuff. I love the maps. Love the data. Uh, does it make me better? Yeah, I just know a little bit more. Doesn't make me a better fishman always, but uh, sometimes it does. Um, then I can go out the next day and everybody's catching fish with me, you know. So then that doesn't do me any good. But I love to learn about that Missouri River system, you know, from Fort Peck all the way down. The, the, the biggest battle to that whole system, whether it's the Missouri River or Lake Oahe, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's never the same. You're constantly, it's constant, a uh, constant uphill battle, no matter what. But for me, it's fun. I enjoy it. Um, it, it, it it's, not a, it's not a gimme. Um, years ago, going out in the river, I felt it was a gimme. It was so consistent. It was so good. It was just, you, you could not, not have a good day. You know, and it definitely got tougher, which ain't a bad thing. Makes you think. Makes you put your, your, your thinking hat on. Try some new things, some new areas, some, some different things. And, and it makes you a better fisherman. And the river makes you a better fisherman. That reservoir makes you a better fisherman because it is not consistent. Your, your, your techniques, a lot of them can stay the same, but just water levels throw you in a tizzy all the time. You're always adjusting, trying to figure it out.
but it's a lot of fun learning and, and having a successful day as you know it feels like you went out there and did something. Anyone else? If I'd never fished Lake Sakakawea, if it was going to be, let's say, mid-May through June, I'd probably start in the East End or the Van Hook Arm. And I would probably, you know, go in there and talk to some bait shops. One thing I think that's really different, and we touched on this while we are driving up, is, is it's, it's not like driving to certain lakes or prairie lakes where you might stop in some place. They say, yeah, just kind of go on the corner here, and there's a tree point, just, you know, start fishing there. It's a little different there. It, it isn't this uh, everyday type of situation. Um, you know, to get up there to learn some things uh, early June. You know, the month of June is great. I would say I would say the month of June is the best for learning. I would say the easiest <coughs> to catch. I mean, some of that stuff in July and stuff you can catch a ton of fish, and they can be you know plentiful. I think July gives you the opportunity to fish deep, fish shallow. Yes. If you like to troll More spinners and bouncers, maybe. crankbaits, you have way more options. Yes. Uh, the Van Hook Arm could probably be more consistent. Um, and it's a little easier to fish. There's a lot more boats, but the areas that you're fishing, or at least learning at the time, are a lot longer, bigger stretches of areas. There are flats. It's it's long shorelines. There's sunken islands. That's a great place too because it's a it's a fun fishery up there. You have to think of what what you like to do too. I, I know a lot of guys that just can't wait for July so they can throw bottom bouncers out and just drift or troll. I don't enjoy that. I like to be standing in the boat all day casting, whether it's a, a jig or whatever. A good day of trolling to me ain't bad either. But I'm not a I'm not just a sit and drift kind of guy. I, I like to be doing stuff the whole time. So if you're looking to take your family out, have probably better chance at, at keeping them happy. The Van Hook Arm again, like Jason said, is a lot more consistent. But if you want to get maybe maybe learn some things. Um, Practice your jigging. I think I think pitching jigs is one of the the hardest things to get really really good at. But to me, it's a it's a hoot. It's the absolute. There's no better way to catch a walleye in my mind than, than casting a jig. You know, if you've never been all. to a uh, lake Sakakawea before, the, the mid section is beautiful. Too. Yes, it is a lot, so of, lot of opportunity there too. The same there, thing there. You can get out and troll. You can do so many different things. And uh, whether it's Indian Hills Resort or Dakota Waters Resort. Um, the people are friendly, they're very willing to tell you kind of where to go, and there's maps to show you. Uh, that Michoud Bay, uh, Beaver Bay, some of the bays, look at that. You can find where people are fishing, you'll see boats. It isn't, they're going to be more spread out in a lot of places. Um, again, I, I love that part of the lake too. Um, I, I'm fortunate, in that, area, that lake, I can kind of decide where I want to go depending on the time of year. You know, uh, early on, I like to be on the east end. And I will start moving mid-June. I'll start moving west. Um, you can hit the Van Hook Arm early all year long if you want to. Um, then mid-section in uh, late June and all through July, I pretty much spend all my time in that mid-section. It's probably a 35-mile stretch. One day I might run 20 miles this day. The next day I might go the opposite direction and go two miles. And, and that's one thing, again, to consider, too. Depending what kind of boats you guys have, do you like to run far? I mean, you can make a 20, 30 mile run out there, no problem, weather permitted. Yeah, I mean, obviously you, you, you play your cards right and watch the weather, but it's not uncommon for guys to put in at Beaver Bay and run 20, 25 miles to the west. Not at all. And you can get away from, there's boats coming, but that lake, that reservoir is so big that you can get away from people if you want to. There, there's not a problem with that. But there are so many trolling opportunities or live baiting opportunities, just areas of that lake that are better for, for one or the other. And then you obviously find some of those areas that you can do everything just within a drop of a pin, you know? What's the best way to monitor? You can go to, there's a, a website. It's on the U.S. Geological Surveys website here in North Dakota. You can find it, just like the Red River would have. It's the, yep. same, it's the same site, same thing. And I just have it on my, I have it bookmarked and I look at it every day. I look at Sakakawea, I look at the river, I look at Fort Peck, I look at Lake Hawaii. Um, just enjoy doing it. Um, is it just history or the forecast? Oh, you can do both. You know, I primarily look at the, the instant data. You know, um, they'll have it in, it'll be typed out, but they also have it in the plot line that's, that's instant. You know, it's pretty, it's, pretty it's close. It's pretty easy to, to see and figure out. It's no yeah. different than any other graph. I mean, it's, it's pretty black yeah. and white. You can see it spike. The river systems around Bismarck <coughs> daily. 
Um, the further north you go, closer to the dam, they can spike feet. Yeah. Every day they do that, which is, that's a fisherman's <coughs> nightmare, it can be, because you go down river in this deep of water and come back in this deep. You know, you're driving by boulders at one time, the next time you come up or down, you know, vice versa, they're gone. Now, on the, on the Missouri right. River, um, they have a three-week projected forecast. And so they kind of tell you what's going to what's going to happen. And so we plan a lot of that, especially if fishing a, a tournament on the river. That really plays a major role, you know. <coughs> especially when on Thursday night before a tournament, you know that they're going to drop the releases or jump them up twenty thousand, you know. And, and and that's kind of a scary situation in that because you, know, uh, you know fish is going to get really really. The tough. absolute best year I ever remember on the Missouri River, the water levels stayed. So consistent all spring, early summer. I mean, I'm talking fluctuates, maybe a half a foot here or whatever, but they didn't spike them, they didn't drop them a week and then another week. And that year was like almost every day you could go out. The, the water is going to change every day, but when it stays consistent, like anything, it's just that much more predictable. And we just don't have that very often. Yeah, so we just want to take the time to say thanks. Uh, we enjoy coming out here, and obviously, we enjoy talking. Uh, and talking about fishing and walleye fishing and everything in between. So it, it, it's great to have the opportunity to come back out here again. And uh, we, we love this club. You know, it's too bad we aren't closer. But then I, get, I don't know that I have any more time anyway. But uh, um, I look forward to uh, the social media part, seeing the, the pictures. And I know there's usually somebody does something when you guys go to Winnipeg on YouTube usually. And I, I don't miss much. You know, I, I'll go from water data to... Uh, to uh, FM Walleyes, you know, I like to see who's coming on a Thursday, and I keep track of the website and social media, so I, I appreciate that. It's, uh, if I can't be out here hanging out doing it, it's, it's at least I can bring up my phone real quick to see what you guys are up to. Uh, one last thing on my part, again, if you guys come out west, if you want to, feel free to contact us, uh, pretty easy. Um, you can touch base tonight yet if you want, or like I said, emails, Facebook, whatever. Get a hold of us, let us know. We'll do what we can to help you out. Thank you, guys. we do here is uh, we give all of our speakers an FM wall hat. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming out. That's in lieu of gas money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming out guys. We really appreciate it. You did Thanks a very good job. Us. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Yeah. All right. A couple of little things here. First of all, we got a lot of raffles back there. We're going to do five minutes uh, ticket. Stop back there to the table, see Brenton or Scott Johnson, get a member ticket. Uh, out here on the tables outside, there's a bunch of free literature for those of you guys that still like to read on real paper instead of a